Welcome to the Lawyerist Podcast with Sam Glover and Aaron Street. Each week, Lawyerist brings you advice and interviews to help you build a more successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are Sam and Aaron. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 143 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with the father of unbundled services, Forrest Mostyn. Today's podcast is sponsored by Ruby Receptionists, and it's smart, charming receptionists who are perfect for small firms. Visit callruby.com slash lawyerist to get a risk-free trial with Ruby. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Clio Legal Practice Management Software. Clio makes running your law firm easier. Try it for free today at Clio.com. So Sam, Lawyerist has been around for 10 years, and I think in that time, you've probably either written or solicited 50 posts related (laughs) to unbundled services and alternative pricing models. And I'm excited for today's conversation, but I'm also a little wary because it's hard for me to conceive how this is still a thing we need to talk about. I mean, it is. And Forrest is great. He started calling it unbundled services. He was one of the pioneers of it. He does it very old school and he admits that during our show. But yeah, I can't believe we still have to convince people that they should be considering limited scope representation and unbundled bundled services as one of the models that they use to approach law practice. It's really common sense to me, and it was common sense to Forrest a long time ago. And I wish it were common sense to everybody because I think it would be a pretty key thing to help close the access to justice gap by letting people get less services, but still adequate services for less money. So is it fair to assume that we think there are hypothetical straw men, boogeymen out there who still object to the idea that this is an okay solution? I'm sure there are some people who like object. I think most of the time, it's like anything else. It's what I'm doing seems fine to me. And so I don't really need to do anything different. That that seems the bit like the biggest enemy of progress to me. So it's inertia, not hatred. Yeah, I think so. like what I would like is if this were a really controversial subject and that if there's like a podcast listener who's really fired up about what bullshit unbundled services is and how <laughs> the billable hour or contingent fee can never die in their practice area. Like I want them to I don't know, pick a Twitter fight with you or something after this episode. I mean, if fair, if you're listening and you think unbundled services are stupid and unethical or just or just stupid, hit me up on Twitter, drop me a line, and I'd like to have you on the podcast and we can fight about it. But barring that, let's learn from Forrest and then just everybody do it so we don't have to keep talking about it. Indeed. Hello, I'm Forrest Mostyn, and I'm in Los Angeles. I'm a solo attorney who uh, works in family law and never goes to court. (laughs) Say more about that. How do you avoid court? Um, I've been sober for nearly 20 years. Uh, made, (laughs) Made a decision that courts are the place of last resort, but that the people I try to help usually end up Uh, much worse and much poorer, no matter what kind of a job I was doing. And so I decided to devote the rest of my career to working with people to resolve in conflict outside of the court system. And so your focus is uh, family law, right? And you focus on mediation and collaborative divorce, it sounds like. Yes, as well as working in a limited scope manner with people who um, otherwise aren't represented. Which brings us to the focus of the podcast, which is that you came up with that whole concept, it sounds like, or at least you were instrumental in it. Well, lots of people have contributed to it, Sam. And let me just say that uh, the presence of unrepresented litigants is both an opportunity and a challenge for uh, the families of uh, this country and the court system. And we had to try to find a way that would help those people who either could not or chose not to have lawyers to get some help to both protect their rights and keep their matters private and within their family. Yeah. So, I mean, how how did you how did you come up with the concept or how did you begin doing limited scope representation? It's actually a great story. In the late 70s. I was uh, uh, assistant regional director for the Federal Trade Commission in Los Angeles. 
and we were investigating the uh, real estate industry. And at that time, uh, as now, many people don't want to pay a 5 6 or 7% commission to real estate brokers. So they wanted to sell their houses themselves. The problem was, how do you get a buyer, even if you have your own flags and escrow documents, et cetera, that you can buy from a commercial company such as Help You Sell, and there are others on the market. And the way that consumers found um, buyers was through um, what we called maverick real estate brokers, brokers who were willing to unbundle their services and just let, for a flat fee, let the home buyer get onto the multiple listing service to which the uh, brokers were subscribers. Hmm. Well, you can imagine the other real estate brokers um, uh, saw red there and were not very happy and started to blackball these maverick brokers. And so the Federal Trade Commission investigated that, and we were able to work out some consent decrees. And that was in 1979. I went back into law practice, practicing family law and mediation. And about 12 years later, it's funny how good ideas sometimes take have a long latency period. Mm -hmm. I was serving on an ABA committee that was studying unrepresented litigants. And the findings, this was in Arizona, the findings of the researchers commissioned by the ABA were that this was an exploding phenomenon of people representing themselves, but they didn't do so well. They didn't mm -hmm. do so well um, in uh, achieving their rights and being able to handle it uh, in a adversarial lawyer-dominated world. And the conclusion was if they just had a little bit of help, a little bit of legal help, it might work. So I'm sitting in a meeting and somehow uh, my FTC experience came to my vortex and I said something like, why don't we unbundle our legal services and just make them available in discrete tasks that people can pay for as they go? Well, this was new to not just to me, but to everyone in the room. And this committee called the Standing Committee of um, Legal Services. Wait, let me guess. The first reaction was that that can't possibly be ethical, right? Actually, that's not true. Really? The ABA has been the leader for uh, this type of public interest legal access. They have been the undisputed leaders um, in getting new rules uh, that would make it uh, easier for lawyers to unbundle and for um, uh, having policy from the House of Delegates that approves it. And this committee was at the absolute center of that. The uh, staff council is still there. His name is William Hornsby. Oh, of course. Well, if Will was there, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, if you know him, you know what a wonderful uh, uh, inspiration uh, he's been over all these decades. And it's really him and um, the various committee members that came after me that have made this work. Hmm. So, I mean, how did you go about actually bringing that into representation, though? I, I know that it, it isn't always easy to introduce a new concept like this into, especially once you get to courts, but even to make clients understand what it is that you're trying to do. Actually, Sam, it's a lot easier than you think. Hmm. People... I actually, I have, a, I have a dream, and one of my dreams is that one day there'll be a rule that says before anyone goes, uh, any lawyer has a client sign a full service contract, there is a duty to inform the client that limited scope service is available as well, so they can make an informed consent consumer choice. Um, but even without that rule, um, I found the clients loved that possibility when they were short of money, as most people are, and yeah. when they have the ability to handle parts of the job, um, it was a, it's a pretty easy sell. And the whole idea of lawyers having retainers and full service when there are, there's an option just doesn't seem to resonate as well with the public as it has done with lawyers. So while full service is, is clearly an, op an option, and it's the preferred option by many, some who can afford it and some who can't, 
those who know about limited scope and can find lawyers that will offer it uh, find that it's uh, very, very satisfying and meets their needs. In fact, it meets their needs so much that malpractice insurance carriers encourage, they actually almost beg their insured to, with, who are lawyers, to unbundle. Hmm. Lawyers Mutual, the, uh, one of the most prominent uh, in, in malpractice insurance companies in California, has done a, a major educational effort to get their, their lawyers, their policyholders, to unbundle. And you can guess why. Yeah. Almost no claims. I suppose. Virtually no claims at all. And the reason is that people are satisfied. So maybe we should back up. I feel like I just uh, dove right in and started talking about unbundled services and limited scope representation. And maybe in 2017, most lawyers, that's fair, maybe most lawyers know what it is now. But but maybe let's give some examples. Like how, when you give clients that option in your own practice, what kinds of unbundled arrangements do you come to? What, are the, what do they look like? What is this package or the service? How do you describe it? Well, I can really talk two ways. One, what does the process look like? And second, what roles, unbundled roles, could I play? In fact, I'll let you, since it's your program, you decide <laughs> which one I talk about first. Well, you know, talk about the roles that you play. Let's, let's frame it around that. Um, the most important role is that of advisor. Um, for a client to be able to come to me and just pay for an hour of my time and I've been doing it for a long time, and there are a lot of experienced lawyers who, in an hour, can really help somebody get a plan of action. And it is up then to the client, do they want that same lawyer to do the work for them, to be the provider as well as the advisor, or do they want to then take it on from there? But it's that hour that people will pay for, and they'll pay my hourly rate, I have no unpaid bills, which is a great thing for lawyers and mm -hmm. for clients, because the client never wants to be behind and owe a lawyer money. It doesn't work very well for the relationship, and um, they have enough problems without being in debt to lawyers. So they, people pay as they go. So advice, whether or not, depending on how much work I'm going to be doing, advice is the foundation. A second role and I find it the, probably the one I do the most, is ghostwriting. And that is, let's say, letters. Um, a client, some of the letters that spouses going through a divorce write each other um, should never make it to the uh, um, open media. They are uh, very brutal and, and generally not very effective for the person who wrote it. Hurtful to the recipient and devastating to the, to the writer who, if it ever gets uh, introduced in court against them. So in the shadows, a client can bring a, a letter or an email or a text to me before she or he sends it. I can then look at it quickly. I can say, well, maybe this can come out and you might want to redo that. And you've got yourself a decent letter. And that can save people tremendous unnecessary conflict and certainly expense. A second way is that they, the client thinks they need my letterhead to be on the letter. Oh, yeah, people really think that. <laughs> and they want me to, to write the letter, but I won't do anything else. So I'll write the other uh, client or his or her lawyer and um, indicate that I've been hired just to write this letter to articulate my client's position and the response should go to my client. If the client wants the response to go to me, then I will handle the negotiations. But they don't have to. They can unbundle the drafting from the representation in negotiations. When people are negotiating themselves, as often happens in family matters, they're sometimes actually living in the same home. I can act as a negotiation coach. Um, clients come in, I, let's say it's the husband, I play the wife, and, I, and I, we, we pretend that we're at Starbucks having a latte, and the, and the husband says, and you know, regarding summer camp, 
I would like X. And except they don't always say it <laughs> in such a, in such a uh, non-adversarial tone. So then we go over it and we might switch roles. I'll play him and he can play his wife and see how it feels. And that is a simulation practice. I can't overstate how important that is so that people can work out their own situation without lawyers, without mediators. They can just do it. So uh, we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to talk more about how you decide uh, how to price this because you talked about one of the benefits being that you never have to worry about collections. So, um, So I want to touch more on that. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. This podcast is supported by Ruby Receptionists. As a matter of fact, Ruby answers our phones at Lawyerist, and my firm was a paying Ruby customer before that. Here's what I love about Ruby. When I'm in the middle of something, I hate to be interrupted, so when the phone rings, it annoys me, and that often carries over into the conversation I have after I pick up the phone, which is why I'm better off not answering my own phone. Instead, Ruby answers the phone, and if the person on the other end asks for me, a friendly, cheerful receptionist from Ruby calls me and asks if I want them to put the call through. It's a buffer that gives me a minute to let go of my annoyance and be a better human being during the call. If you want to be a better human being on the phone, give Ruby a try. Go to callruby.com slash lawyerist to sign up, and Ruby will waive the $95 setup fee. If you aren't happy with Ruby for any reason, you can get your money back during your first three weeks. I'm pretty sure you'll stick around, but since there is no risk, you might as well try. Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. You could invest in marketing your firm, you could spend more time helping clients in need, or you could catch your daughter's soccer game. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With Clio, tracking time, billing, and matter management are fast and easy, giving you more time to focus on what really matters. And Clio is a complete practice management platform with plenty of tools and over 50 integrations to help you automate daily tasks such as document generation and court calendaring. See how the right software can make it easier to manage your practice. Try Clio for free today at Clio.com. Okay, and we're back. And Forrest, so you talked about one of the benefits being that when you do unbundled services, you get paid uh, up front and you're not you know, carrying bills from your clients. So how do, you, how do you think about pricing? How do you price your unbundled services? And how do you talk about that with clients? Sam, I never thought I was about to say what I'm about to say, <laughs> but I'm a first generation unbundler. Uh, I'm almost a horse and buggy unbundler. <laughs> so um, there have been a lot more um, wonderful models that have come since I started. But I still do it the old-fashioned way. People pay me for my time. They know how much t- I, I, I give them an estimate of how much time it will be, and that's all I'll do. If they want an hour or two, that's what they'll pay for, and I won't give them any more time, and um, and, and they're done. Other uh, wonderful lawyers do so, do a flat fee for various work, um, whether it's drafting or it's negotiation or working by the day. And uh, people can really get even a better consumer idea than when, than working from, with me. It seems to me that with limited scope representation, limiting the scope is really key, especially when you're billing by the hour. And so there's no automatic end point that you might be understood. So does that mean you're assigning a retainer every single time you agree to do work for a client? No. Um, you, you, you start with, a, with a, um, uh, a, re, a special limited scope agreement, and actually many states have templates uh, that uh, are available, and uh, I have the one that I use, and it's got a little checklist. And the checklist is, what are the services that I'm going to work on? Gotcha. Uh, one of those that I'll never work on is making a limited court appearance for clients. I never do uh, that because I've retired from my court work. But there are really qualified family lawyers who will make a limited scope appearance and not have to do the whole thing, but just do one hearing or uh, one motion, and that's it. And the client will be able to do the rest of it and keep the costs down. There are in many states, and I can think of right now in Maine and Colorado and Florida and um, California, approved forms that the courts will take and other counsel will respect that, that indicates the limited limitation of scope. 
And that is a real benefit for clients uh, because, number one, the lawyers aren't afraid to make a limited court appearance because after the appearance they can get out and they don't have to keep representing that client and the client doesn't have to keep paying. Um, and in the many states, I know your, your podcast may go uh, well beyond the states I mentioned, in those other states, um, the, the public and the, and the lawyers don't have that advantage. And, and in fact, there's going to be a national unbundling conference. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, tell us oh, about yes. it. It is on the uh, 26th and 27th of this month in Denver, and it is the second uh, national unbundling conference. The first was in 2000 in Baltimore. So now 17 years have gone by. And um, in those 17 years, um, the state of the art right now is that most states have the laws. They just don't have the implementation. This is called an ABA implementation conference to try to get states to get unbundling and limited scope work um, into the courts, get educational programs approved by the states, and get lawyers on the local level to uh, learn about it, get trained in it, and offer it to clients. So can we expect to see model rules and templates coming out of this, for example? The interesting thing is the rules are there. Mm. They're, they're <laughs> in, I think, 40 states, they have uh, limited scope rules um, and, and uh, opinions. It isn't the rules. It's the implementation of those rules. There's going to be actually a national unbundling training for lawyers on the 5th and 6th of March in Chicago. Uh, are you aware of AFCC, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts out of Whoa. Madison, Wisconsin? They're sponsoring it. It's an interdisciplinary organization. Uh, AFCC is well known in the family field for interdisciplinary work. And its, um, it's executive director, uh, Peter Salem, is very, very supportive of unbundled services and is offering this training, and I'll be the trainer. Well, I mean, I've heard that something like 75 to 85 percent of family court litigants are unrepresented, so it would make sense that there's almost a crisis, or maybe there is a crisis in, in family law where people really need more help, and this seems like probably the only realistic way to get it to them. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true, and um, it's obvious to judges, it's obvious to um, uh, national organizations, and it will be obvious more to the public and to the main street lawyer uh, soon. So what kind of guidance can we give to lawyers who are favorable to unbundling, whether because of this podcast or already were, but just aren't sure how to go about implementing it? Okay. The first thing is just to remember the two benefits. One, no receivables. You get paid. Mm -hmm. And number two, there have been virtually no claims. So you're, it's safe and it's profitable. And okay, that, but but aren't you? Like, I mean, so this is an objection that I can imagine, which is, but I I want to get paid more, right? I want the three thousand dollar retainer. I don't want the five hundred dollar or the two hundred dollar, you know, piecemeal representation. I want the big chunks. Are you talking about the lawyers now? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, there's two benefits for lawyers. One, the little chunk may be better than no chunk at all. Yeah. Remember the number of people who go unrepresented completely. And second, it isn't so easy to represent yourself even with a little legal help. Yeah. And so what happens is that um, if, in fact, the other party or lawyer is very, very difficult or doing the work is much harder than the, than the client thought, guess who they'll hire for full service? Yeah. It's that lawyer who is willing to do limited scope service. It is a fabulous way to get new clients. Well, and, and to be realistic, the, the legal process is complicated from end to end because somebody comes to hire you for one unbundled service at the beginning, it is increasingly likely that they're going to need more uh, throughout the course of their representation. Sam, you're exactly right. And people really appreciate it. They really appreciate um, also the spirit of unbundling. Um, the lawyers that unbundle care about helping. That's why they do it. You're not going to make a fortune doing it. 
On the other hand, it's a very nice way to make a Although I would say, so my approach to unbundling in my practice was to do flat fees. Since I wasn't billing by the hour, I was able to find efficiencies and I found that if I was getting a day where I was doing one unbundled thing after another, I was usually making substantially more than my hourly fee would have been. So if you can scale it, I think there's actually plenty of opportunity to make more than you would otherwise. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, in fact, Sam, uh, you are welcome to come to this. Uh, <laughs> I was invited, but I have a conflict. Okay. <laughs> I'll be in Disneyland. <laughs> okay. Well, no one could ever compete with Disneyland. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, under, I understand. And unbundling will always be there, but being at Disneyland on a special trip, especially with children, is priceless. So what are the, are there any pitfalls that lawyers should look out for, things that they can get into trouble with on unbundling? Of course, just like in any practice. Um, uh, only handle what they're competent to handle. Don't do things that you're not comfortable with or capable of. For example, if somebody comes in with one day to go with a huge summary judgment motion or um, other uh, big tasks, um, the answer is, I'm sorry, had you only come in two weeks ago, I would have been glad to help you. I can't do it now. Um, there is no pass for malpractice for the for the work that, that a lawyer takes on and there shouldn't mm -hmm. be they yeah. they are required to serve the public with a reasonable standard of care and it doesn't matter whether they're unbundled or they're full service where it benefits is that because there is a written agreement and there must be a written agreement that's another pitfall is that um, if a, a lawyer just gets so busy they start helping they don't have a, a written a limited scope agreement, which is required for informed consent, then I think there could be problems down the road. And, and I think you alluded to one of the other problems earlier, which is, um, which is kind of the same thing, which is accidentally getting yourself into full representation by entering an appearance without getting your limited scope appearance approved beforehand or talking to opposing counsel as if you're the full scope lawyer when you don't mean to be doing that. I, I think that's another one is you always want to be clear with everyone involved that you are doing the role that you're doing and you're not their full service lawyer. That's absolutely true. Um, I, I'd also say that um, if, in fact, you can uh, have a state uh, or the state is able to get these pre-approved, judicially um, approved forms, that mm -hmm. is the gateway. It's the protection for the public and for for the lawyers. Although I've always said, you know, if you have a client and you really want to help them and you have to go in for a criminal defense hearing, for example, which is in our state at least notoriously difficult to get out of a case, what I've told people to do is uh, walk in there with your motion for a limited scope appearance and deal with that first. <laughs> and then... Well, that's right. And, and <laughs> um, the practice is most, most lawyers will do that. Mm -hmm. They do not want to be stuck in on a case. And Criminal defense, though, has often its special role. Yeah. So we've been discussing uh, limited scope for civil, not for, for criminal. Well, and in bankruptcy, I, it sounds like unbundled is almost a dirty word. Bankruptcy courts accuse lawyers of trying to have an unbundled representation, and sometimes... It's changing, though. Now, yeah. um, uh, many, many jurisdictions are encouraging it uh, because... If there's one place where people don't have a lot of money, it's bankruptcy court. <laughs> there is a yeah. problem, as you know, in some immigration uh, courts uh, yeah, who won't permit unbundling, uh, but that's a whole different policy and uh, political issue that we won't get into here. <laughs> and I think on balance, most judges, uh, most courts in most proceedings would rather have a lawyer helping to speed things along with competent help than to have a pro se person who isn't knowledgeable or experienced and is just doing their best, usually the help from a lawyer is going to make it easier to move things along and get the thing done. You're, you're so right, Sam. Um, I, uh, uh, I call it the, uh, the shoebox problem, where somebody comes into court with a shoebox full of receipts and they have reimbursements or, or payments that they want to show the judge, and the judge says, and so... Um, Mr. X, could you please just tell me how much money you're asking for? And they start pawing through these, uh, this, this box 
and everybody's watching. The judge gets impatient, and of course you're not going to get um, all that you're entitled to. But if you went to a lawyer who even used a paralegal or lower cost associate to go through that box before the hearing to put it into um, to put it into a uh, uh, a chart and, and or a notebook for the with all the receipts and make one copy for the judge and one for the other side and one for the client. The, the client's then good to go, mm -hmm. and they can they can present their case very very well. Uh, judges also are very uncomfortable about leaning over and trying to protect one side against the other. Um, some will do it in a very very nice way, but never enough. The research is uh, very, very clear that while judges believe that they will intervene and um, give the word is deference to the unrepresented, that the results of someone being unrepresented are catastrophic. <laughs> and and yeah. it's, it's, it's not a fair fight. Everyone right. does better with a lawyer. Yep. So by, by way of moving to a close here... Uh, where should lawyers go for a resource if they want to learn more about how to do unbundling services, besides lawyerist, obviously? <laughs> now, you realize that is a unpaid softball uh, <laughs> because my new, my new book has just been released in the last month yep. called Unbundled Legal Services, A Family Law Lawyer's Guide. Um, uh, and I, people can get it off of my website. Um, and it's published by the ABA. Fantastic. We'll definitely include that link in the show notes. And you've also given us a white paper, a checklist of yours uh, with tips for starting an unbundled practice. And I really appreciate that. So thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for talking about unbundled services. And I hope we'll hear more from you soon. My pleasure, Sam. Thank you for having me on. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.